talk by coming this afternoon. I think you can see clearly where the exits are. Um, we're on for about two hours. Could you please check that your phones are turned off? And um, at the end, we'll be doing a raffle ticket um, for some of Noel's books. Um, I think you've got about a one in three chance of bringing one, so it's worth paying around for. And the raffle tickets are in those bags. So, thank you all for coming. And I'd like to start by introducing Deb Bray. This is her book, Grief to Peace for Young Widows Getting There. Debray is a Mackay local who works as a consultant, author and coach. She mostly works in the non-for-profit sector with services for women, mental health and people with disabilities and aged care. In 2019, Deb was the winner of the Northern Queensland Women Women's Business Award. And um, she as I said, publishes the book and um, supports women, families, friends and professionals wanting to understand the world of a grieving person. So I'll happily hand over to Deb, who's far more experienced in this area than I am speaking. Thank you, Thank you Julia. Hello everyone, it's wonderful to see you all here this afternoon. Such a great crowd and so many people who are interested in making sure that their retirement is one um, that's, that um, is happy and meets their needs. Um, I'm here to talk with you a little bit about some of the work that I do um, and what I see that is happening for people who are in their retirement. Uh, so I wanted to start by asking you a question. Uh, and that question is, have you ever been in a situation when you're seeing someone who's struggling and you'd really like to help them but you have no idea what to do? You know, have no idea who to ask or where to start. Or it might be that you are in um, a situation where you're really struggling and you want some help, but you have no idea where to start either. Has there been, anyone ever been in that situation? Can you put your hand up if you have? Yep, yep, so there's a lot of people who can relate to that. And uh, with the work that I do, these are the kinds of things that I see happening for people. So I wanted to talk with you about some of the services that are available uh, to make sure that when you are in that situation or if you see someone who is, you are able to help them. Because uh, retirement is about making sure that you're financially secure, that's very important. And also what I've seen is that a lot of people in retirement lose connection. And then when we lose connection with other people around us, then lots of other things start to go wrong with us. So this is about how can I maintain that connection so that my retirement is healthy financially and, and as well as mentally and emotionally healthy as well. So the first thing that I wanted to talk with you is about a group that's called Wattle, Women Acting Together Through Loss Towards Empowerment. So as Julia mentioned, I've written a book about dealing with grief. I um, have been a widow myself. I'm, I'm remarried. I don't know if I am a widow or not a widow or what I am, but I was a widow for a while. Uh, and I did, did a lot of research, talked to a lot of other women in the, in the region, and we put together a, a group um, that's an opportunity for women who are widows to come together. We say that it's for young widows, but I'm 55 and I'm not leaving. So we say now that it's for women who are young at heart. Uh, and it's an opportunity for people to come together to talk and to people be with people who get it, who understand what they're going through. And it's again, it's about that connection, making that connection with other people in your community. The other thing that I wanted to talk with you is uh, about is called Real Mates Talk. Has anyone heard of Real Mates Talk before? Here? Yeah, some people have, fantastic. So some of the work that I have done uh, is with uh, mental health organisations and in suicide prevention. And one of the things was, that was noticed was that uh, most of the people who die by suicide are men, uh, and it's across all ages. We, we think it's mostly younger men, but it's not. It's across all ages. And, uh, and, and most of those men have never asked for help. So Real Mates Talk is something that started in this community by men in this community, and it's about supporting men to link with other men, just to have a conversation, just to be able to say, how are you going? And for men to be able to say, I'm not going so well, is there someone who can help me? 
So there are more than 120 ambassadors for Real Maze Talk across Whitsunday, Isaac and Mackay. And if you'd like to be part of that, I can definitely put you in touch with the right people. They're always looking for anyone, men from any walks of life who, who'd love to be part of that group. And of course, if you need any help, they can help you with that too. They've got a fantastic website. Uh, the other thing I wanted to tell you about, again, for the men, is another group called Shed Happens. So Shed Happens was started in Mackay by a man named Frank Cowell. Frank Cowell was actually the Citizen of the Year for 2022 in Mackay. And Shed Happens is a group that meets every month and it's an opportunity for men to come together and have a space to uh, share and talk and work through things that might be happening for them. And again, just connect with other people in their community so when something's going wrong, they've got someone to lean on. And one of the events that Shed Happens does every year is International Men of the Year. They have a, a, a men's day breakfast. It's International Men's Day on the 19th of November. So there's a breakfast on the 18th of November. Um, women can go to, I've, I've been to a few of them and they're absolutely fantastic. Just supporting men to understand what it, what it means to be a man and how you be a man in, in the current community. Uh, uh, Frank told me there's not very many tickets left. So if you want to go to that, you need to get in soon. And the last thing that I wanted to talk with you about is, well, back at the beginning. So um, uh, based on a lot of the stories that I hear from men and from women in the community, I started to interview lots of women mostly and talk about what kinds of things would help you in this space. So I've put together some resources around that, which are some workshops, uh, retreats, some online uh, um, online courses that women can do and some coaching. So um, this it's called Celebrate Me and it's an opportunity for uh, women to connect with other women and, and talk about the kinds of things that are happening for them, particularly something called the mental load. Uh, and there's a brochure about that in your packs that you have and there's also a sheet out the front if you'd like to sign that to get some more information and, and I can send you some free resources around um, some of the grief guides as well, if there's anyone who'd like to get a copy of those. So that's it for me. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for coming this afternoon, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Bert. There's much more information about Deb in the show bags you have. Now, the person you've come to see, oh, will you go? Um, He's a friend and mentor of mine now for over 40 years. Oh, sorry, over 20 years. <laughs> um, and I remember being ushered nervously into his office to meet Noel Whitaker. Remember John Marshall? Ushered yes. <laughs> and he looked up from his desk and looked at me and he said, do you play golf? And I said, no. <laughs> and that was the end of that for a while. But anyway, I found I gave some really good answers to Pax advice, so it worked in the end. Um, now, it's a, it was a big day for me. That's why I remember it over 20 years ago. And I'd like to take a minute to explain to you why, for anyone, I think most people do here know you. But Noel is an international best-selling author, finance and investment expert, radio broadcaster, newspaper columnist, public speaker, one of the world's most foremost authorities on personal finance. Noel reaches over 3 million readers each week through his columns. Um, and in major Australian newspapers all over Australia. He is a regular contributor to magazines and websites and appears on radio and television. You might have heard him last week on our local radio. He is one of Australia's most successful authors. He um, has written 26 best-selling, two of which I'm proud to say was with me. Um, he's achieved worldwide sales of more than 2 million copies. His new book, Retirement Made Simple and 10 Simple Steps to Financial Freedom. Two new books. Yeah. Two new books. Yes, yes. Um, are on the bestseller list and we're giving them away today. So hold on to those record tickets. Um, in 2011, he was made a member of the Order of Australia for service to the community in raising awareness of personal finances. 
In 2016, he accepted a position as independent director of VGI Global Limited, which list is listed on the Australian Stock Exchange in, on the 28th of September 2017. So you can see he is not the person to come to for advice on how to retire. <laughs> He's a member of the Australian Securities and Investment Commission Regional Liaison Committee and is an executive in residence with the Facility of Business at Queensland University of Technology. Welcome, Noel. Thanks, Julia. <laughs> Thank you. It's funny she was talking about John Marshall. We're supposed to play nine holes yesterday. He rings me up at three o'clock. Mate, I was backing out of the driveway in the Mercedes, wasn't looking, hit the neighbor's car. Serious damage. So he didn't play golf yesterday, Julia. But that happens, right? Gotcha. You've got a couple of hours, you know, now, and you're gonna get a lot of stuff put on you. You've got so much that your mind will be expanding. But I'll try to hit the key points. Because if you can take the key points of what I'll be telling you, that lets you know where to go next, all right? There's no simple answers. But the first one is you must be observant. Oh, what's, sorry, oh no, sorry. That came out this morning. Uh, this morning. Um, I'm sorry about the overheads. The, the computer's perfect, but the, this is not, but that's anyway. Uh, 12 million Australians are concerned about retirement. Three in five don't think they're gonna have enough, you know? So it's a major issue. Uh, so they're the kind of things we'll cover. Do you know what's the major factor in how much you need to retire? How long are you going to live? Well, there's no simple answer. It depends on the rate of return you can achieve, how long you live, the kind of wine you drink, whether you travel first class or coach, or whether you don't travel. You know, so there's so many variables. As I say in my book, one of the tricks is you do a budget now, then, then go forward taking out the expenses that you, that you won't need after you retire. And that's a good way to start. Then you go to the inflation calculator on my website and just put in those numbers. That will tell you what it will be in eight or nine years. But the, but the rate of inflation is critical. But above all, you must be able to be observant. So look at that picture for me. All got it? All got it? What colour was the arrow? Green. Green. No. What colour was the arrow? Come on. Put it back up. How about that? How about white? Oh. White arrow. See that? And the aim of that is when you walk out tonight, I want you to see the world a bit differently. When you see a FedEx truck, you'll see the arrow now. Every single time. How about that? Now, you also must be able to count. <laughs> so, so count the legs for me. Come on. Count the legs. Anybody? Come on. Have a guess. No one knows. It's a trick picture. But that, to me, is what it's about the... The tusks, eyes, tail, eyes, tail are the basic fundamentals. They don't change, do they? In your, in your uh, packs, in my 20 commandments of wealth, and they'll be as valid in a thousand years as now. You don't go guarantor for your kids, right? You get advice before you sign the documents, not after, right? You can't rewrite history. If someone rings you with a deal, you do what? Hang up real fast. I would get two calls a day from Amazon, FedEx. It's all scams, right? There are scams everywhere. Everywhere. And a lot of people get conned. Um, ASIC released this morning that 40 ways to get scammed. It's everywhere. There'll be things like, oh, the, the uh, parcel's coming. C click on the link to get the parcel. I regularly get your your gateway tolls expired. It's all scams. So there we are. But those legs, they're the superannuation rules, pension rules, aged care rules. They're all the things which are changing, and you need guidance on that. So to become successful and retired, 
you need to understand the basics but don't change and, and get advice on, on what does. Okay. Now, what's the biggest threat to the world at the moment? And don't say climate change, please. I'm watching all the coal ships out there. What's the biggest threat? War. I'm not worried about war, no. We are living longer, aren't we? Yeah, Australia is now the third longest living country in Australia. Life expectancies. So, so a lot, we've got long life expectancies. And it's coming. And it's been coming and coming and coming and coming. You know. But if you look at that, that's a pretty, they're pretty scary numbers. I mean, in, in just nine, in, in 11 short years, no, not yet, 2000. No, 2031, nine years, nine years, nine years, nine years. Yeah. The, the over 75s will increase by 101%. Isn't that extraordinary? But the people who work and pay the taxes will increase by 28%. So there's less and less people working to pay the taxes. Uh, but to make it worse, Oh, sorry, it was all caused when World War II finished in 1946, we started the breed, didn't we? And we bred these baby boomers. Many of you are baby boomers. If you're born between 1946 and 1964, you're a baby boomer. And that's most of you guys, all right? So in 1946, it looked like that. Everybody smoked, didn't they? And all the ads were for smoking. And then we had that. That's a good one. I like that one. <laughs> you imagine a company running that now. You'd be cancelled. You'd be in huge trouble. That's a good one. This was 1946, people. 46. Then we get to 1964 and we had that. Oh, sorry, I missed that one. That one, you see? And you wouldn't get away with that today, would you? And how about this one? And look at that one. Come on. And we saw those that we didn't need counselling, did we? We thought that was funny. It didn't give us, you know, heartburn or anything. Then we got 2022. How about that? Now we're getting modern, aren't we? That's real graphics, that is, isn't it? And that one? That one? <laughs> Do you know how they invented Viagra? Pfizer invented a blood tablet which didn't work, and when they recalled it, the guys wouldn't give it back. <laughs> and now, so this is, this is what we're facing, and this is the serious part. This is 1970, workers and retirees. 1990, workers, retirees. 2012, worker, retirees. And that's now, you know. So if you're young, you think, what are they going to do to me? <laughs> What are you going to do to me? It's frightening, isn't it? So, one good thing about it, as our numbers grow, we've got a voice, haven't we? And we've got to use it. Because on our backs is a target. You're all these wealthy baby boomers, you've got too much, you bought cheap houses, we're going to get you. So I urge you just to be conscious, that's all. Uh, now, it would all be good if there was a big pot of money but global debts now reached, well, so many trillions you can't count it. Every country is running broke. The pension funds in the UK and America are the worst off because they pay indexed pensions. Now, if you're an actuary in one of those pension funds, you've got to forecast the rate of inflation and how long your members are going to last, don't you? Well, your members are living longer than you forecast Inflation's four times what you forecast. And you've got a whole stack of bonds with negative interest rates. You know, about a month ago, the pension funds in Britain almost went broke. That's how bad it was. So that's the world. So the world's in a challenging place. And the, our tax system is crazy. Now, that on the, this side is numbers. So this is the number of people. Can you see that? That's the number of people in the top bracket. That's the number in the second bracket. Can you see that? So those two people pay that much tax. See that? Look at that. Wow. 
and they try and cut taxes and they run the things like, oh, well, the wealthy blokes get more than the poor bloke. Well, that's the thing about a progressive tax system. And uh, they talk about if a person earned four million bucks, they'd get so much increase. No one has a taxable income of four million. In fact, I, ran, I looked it up, it's a chart about three years ago. It had postcodes in Australia by income tax. Guess what was the highest earning postcode? Point Piper. Guess what the tax, the average tax was? 179,500. And I said to a mate in the tax office, how come? He said, well, if you're in Point Piper, you won't get over the top rate, will you? <laughs> so there's so much rubbish about it, but this is really difficult because uh, these people have got families and it's, it's getting harder for them. Of course, the big thing's inflation. We thought it was dead. <clears throat> well, inflation's getting worse and worse, isn't it? My daughter tells me her Coles bill's never been bigger. My son has got seven kids, reckon, 150 bucks to fill up the Kia Carnival, you know, <laughs> the diesel. At Noosa now, most restaurants in Noosa don't, don't open for breakfast anymore because the staff can't afford to live there and they can't afford to drive there. <laughs> so inflation is very, very serious. Now, we also have a shrinkflation. Have you heard of, sh of shrinkflation? <laughs> that means the buggers put less lollies in the box. They're doing it, aren't they? Instead of getting four boxes of chocolate, you get three. Like, this is American numbers, but Doritos, 9.7 to 9.25. Walmart paper towels, 168 to 120. Now, 168 to 1, that's about a 40% increase in price, isn't it? So that's the next thing to face. Um, and now, <clears throat> I think there's serious trouble coming. In, the, the average loan is $600,000. Now, I know it can be meaningless, but if you do a Google on the average home loan in Australia, it's about 600 grand. It may be less here, it may be, you know, but I'm just saying. A lot of people have got a loan of 600,000. Their mortgage has, go, has gone or will go up by 4%. For sure. It's already gone up most of that, I think. That means 24,000 a year extra income, extra interest. That family's got to find $500 a week more from after-tax dollars. Now, given most families live paycheck to paycheck, how will they do it? Christmas is coming, yes, and then school fees come. And uh, interesting, the Commonwealth Bank announced the boss yesterday said that he thinks inflation will reduce because of all the unemployment coming. That, for me, isn't, isn't evident yet. And of course, Albo's going to build a million houses in five years. <laughs> now, you, now, you can't get a tradie now, so where Albo's are going to get the land, I don't know. But so, it's coming. And this is... I, I saw that in, in Brisbane. They're now advertising... Look at the people on that ad. It's got everyone. You've got an old lady, you've got an Asian person, you've got a couple, you know, all nice, decent people, all being lured into this payday lending and stuff. And, and, now, and now the kids have got afterpay. And that's frightening, isn't it? The fees on that, you know. Um, and this is interesting, I thought, that what I did was, I looked at the average house, first home, in, in 2019, and that was 620 grand. Is that about the same here, maybe a bit more, a bit less? About the same? And to buy that, you needed the 120,000 deposit to avoid mortgage insurance, and a loan of 500 grand. See that? And you repaid 450 a week. Today's young couple, to buy that home, which is currently worth $865,000, up from 620 in three years, deposit 175, loan 690, repayments $953 a week. Because of the combination of increased house prices and interest rates, it costs the first time buyer twice as much in repayments. Like 953 is a lot of money for a family. But back then, you had to have 
Family income of 110,000 to qualify, now it's 160. So, you know, interesting, isn't it? That's inflation. Now, the biggest rubbish I'm hearing is, oh, well, when inflation is fixed, the Reserve Bank will cut rates. The Reserve Bank will not cut rates in your lifetime. Banks around the world drop rates far too low. They're now winding back to what they see as normal and there, and there they will sit. Now I reckon they'll go to four. Westpac says 3.8. There's a con some people say four and a half. But the cash rate will keep moving up and will not go down. The Reserve Bank may do this, but they won't do this. That makes sense? And I think that's the biggest enemy you've got. That's your biggest enemy, and that's your saviour. Now, I've just come back from a month in America. You've been to America lately? You might need an overdraft. It's the dearest place in the world. I kept my ING debit card with me, which means you're only spending money that you have. And you look at your phone, you know what you're, if you're doing your Christmas shopping, you know what you've got left. Because what happens every time the credit card bill comes in? What happens? Credit card bill comes. And you say, what? Exactly. It's bigger than I thought, isn't it? I think it couldn't be that much. And they're so sneaky. In tiny print is the amount to pay, and big print, the minimum amount. Because they want to get you paying the minimum to charge you interest at 20%. You know? Debit cards are great. America's frightening. Uh, it's the same number, so a cup of coffee is five. Breakfast is 15 to 20. You go out to eat, a bottle of wine is 60, right? And mains are 40 to 50. So you take that number, add on a 9% Californian state tax, and 2.5 levy for the health insurance for the staff, and a 20% tip and 1.6 on the conversion, and you're talking double. Now, I took our kids out a few times. I couldn't get under $800 for a night out. <laughs> and that was one bottle of wine and sharing stuff. Seriously. Seriously. A cup of coffee is 10 bucks. Take them out for breakfast, 140 for breakfast. So if you're going traveling, for God's sake, do a budget first. It's the same in Europe. The same in London. If you're in London, main course is 40 quid. Then you've got a VAT, then you've got conversion. So, but that's magic. It also refunds the, the hidden fees. Now, I got my Amex to arrive this morning, and I hadn't defaulted my Uber off Amex to ING when I got to California. And the, the fees Amex were charging were horrendous. Like $40 fee, about a dollar in fees on top of that. So never use Amex. But also we got caught. We checked into a hotel and I handed over the latitude card. My wife's ING got scammed. All of a sudden we started seeing six transactions, zero, 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 dollar and dollar to Microsoft. Rang ING, scam, card stopped. So she's got no card except the latitude card. Luckily we have a latitude card as well, which has also got a good rate, but it's a credit card. This is, this is by far the best. So we check into a hotel, we have a game of golf down at Newport. Check into a hotel, you know the hotels always take the card? Well, all of a sudden the card's blocked. Well, oh, we stuck a few extra thousand on in case. So then you've got to ring up Latitude from over in America, wait on the phone to unblock it. Well, they said, we can't unblock it. I said to the hotel, for God's sake, process the rooms now, or we don't do that. So in the end I said, look, give me the latitude back, take the Amex card and hold that, and that fixed it, you see? Because all you want is the card to hold it. So that's one of the greatest tricks travelling. So you always want to go two credit cards if you're travelling overseas. And the next credit card trick is, I get this all the time, lovely couple, normally he's got the MasterCard and she's got the supplementary, right? You know? And what happens when he dies? 
her card's cancelled. Do you try and get a credit card at your age? You won't. I can't get one. I got a mate, he's a, he's a senior partner of Clayton Newts, just retired, 14 million in super. His wife's got 5 million in share. He couldn't get a credit card. Because you're too old. The banks are crazy. And I put it to a banker, he said, the reason we don't want to give them credit cards is, is they're going to pay it back on time and, and there's nothing in it for us. So by all means, if you're a couple, make sure you've got your own card each. And do it now while you can, all right? Makes sense? Or a debit card, I mean, there's no... Anyone can get that, that's all you need, because the points are useless. These days, points are, points are useless. What happens if that debit card's on, on a joint account? Oh, well, what the debit card's doing is debiting your account. It's just the way you transfer money you've got. Oh yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I digress a bit here anyway. Now, this is a must. Part, part from the credit cards, which are a must, and taking two overseas is, is a must, and having one each if you're a couple is a must, right? Compounding. Now, compounding in action, notice every time your money doubles, there's more money in the last double than all the previous doubles. See that? See that? I tell the story of the lily in the pond. <clears throat> the lily in the pond starts as a tiny speck, doubles every day, and fills the pond in, t in 10 days. How long to go from quarter full to full? Two days. Quarter full to half on the ninth, half to fall on the tenth. Now if that was your investment time frame while you're working and you had to stop on the eighth day and cash in your super, you've missed out on three quarters of what you could have had. Isn't that scary? But there's a way around it. This is, this slide you should copy this and talk about it and think about it, never forget it, right? The guy is 60 earning 100 grand a year. He's got 500,000 in, in, in super. He wants to leave work. If he can defer work until 65, his super goes up by 40%. Just five more years at work takes your super. And then you say 60, he has 800,000, not, not 500,000. And five more years, it's 1.2 million. Because this again, it's the last days in the loop on, isn't it? See, compounding is at its best when you're old. An old guy said to me once, Chinese proverb, best cashews come when teeth too old to chew. <laughs> okay, now, and this is a great example. How long your money lasts depends on the rate. Which is why fees are set. You don't want a high fee fund. See, if you're 65, with a million bucks in super, you draw 60 grand, at 8% it's 99, 5% 84. So I can't stress enough the importance of having assets that will grow. Questions, comments? That makes sense for you. This is, this is the big stuff. Yeah, that's your debt return. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now that's what the super funds have done. As we know, super funds have had a crap few months. Crap. Yeah, oh yeah. So this is like, and this is, this is a c c accumulation. They pay 15% tax. Pension funds, they don't pay any tax. So pension funds will always be higher because they don't pay any tax. So for the last year, minus 5.7, minus 8.5. See that? Minus 6.5. There you are. But, but over the last 10 years, they've done seven and four and eight, so they'll bounce back. There is a recession coming, there's no doubt about that. There'll be a recession, there's no doubt. But historically, now it's the American elections tonight right here, 
Historically, the markets fall be before the midterms and have a boost after the midterms. Histori historically, markets go down as the recession comes and bounce back quickly. So if a recession comes, wacko, the super's coming back. All right? So don't fear having a recession. Now, now taxes. <coughs> what taxes would you rather pay? Direct taxes on your like income tax or your GST or capital gains tax? What's your favourite tax? Come on. What's your favourite? Come on. Capital gains tax? He, he's GST, capital gains tax? You've heard me before. No, it means you find money. <laughs> capital gains tax, why? You don't pay it till you dispose of the asset. So I talk about you accumulate, accumulate, no CGT to your cell. And death doesn't trigger it. Your kids inherit it and they don't pay CGT until they sell the asset. It means you can go through all your life paying no tax on the growth. And most investments are more growth than income. That makes sense? And also it's half price when you do get it. You get a discount. So, now Julia Hartman, my good friend, who's a very lateral thinker over here, We've written a couple of books together. And she fell off a brand or something. What did you do, Julia? One step, just one step. One step for mankind. Okay. There's a couple of people here that saw it happen. Oh my God. <laughs> what did you do to her? <laughs> wasn't you. Oh, that's Julia. Come on, tell them. Okay. What about the end? We will be all the way, All right. Um, now, my absolute tax tip for anything is good record And it's what people hate doing, but just remember the hourly rate is very good. Now, and I'll talk to you about capital gains tax and think about when your kids inherit it, how they're going to know what your cost base is. Is the tax office going to end up taxing them on the whole sale proceeds because they've got no way of proving what you paid for the asset? How yeah, about your contract file on your border? Well, that's only if it's a product. I've, oh, I've, yeah. I've been through plenty of experiences with shares that we've got oh, yeah. no idea what the parents yeah. paid for, we've True. got no way of proving it. And in tax law, the answer to proof is on you. Yes. So I get letters all the time, like emails that my Granddad died and we had no idea when he got those shares. Mm. To make it worse, sometimes the, the companies have changed names, like they've merged or something. Yeah. The state mortgage was the worst. Oh, and well. That was taken over by a firm that didn't keep their records. Yeah. They were paying 18% capital guarantee. Oh, okay. It was until they went broke. Yeah, okay. I think we've got to start making each other. I know, I don't think we're sending off something. Okay. So, um, the other thing I want to point out all the ways you Against the tax trap. For example, oh. if you go overseas to live with your children in America, and only get settled over there. You leave the mic, Joe. I do leave the mic, Joe. I'm not making it any worse than I can. <laughs> so you're over there in James, and you decide to sell your house in Australia because you need to stay there with him, you can't come back. Well, you lose your main residence exemption for that house the whole time you owned it. Right back to the day you bought it. That's my house in Brisbane. Yeah, assuming it's post 85, because you were a non resident of Australia when you bought, when you sold it. Hell. Yeah. So don't ever think I don't need a few records for my home. Jeez. Now, if you die overseas while you're living there, uh, there's a bit of a contradiction, isn't it? But anyway. That's the big bill you got for buying out, yeah. Sorry, I'll be for the bill. Yeah. yeah, and if you've been over there for longer than six years than that, well then, yeah, the, there's no protection for the house that's or totally exposed to capital gains tax. So you can lose that main residence very exemption very easily. You can use it, lose it by just demolishing the house because the land's worth more and you get better value without the house sitting on it. That's it. My residence exemption has gone retrospectively. Mm. Capital gains tax applies even to your wedding ring, your jewellery, collectibles, anything like that. Now you might think, oh, that's all right. You know, when you use Noel's theory, you're never going to sell, but you are more likely to gift it. And you gift it, and that triggers a capital gains tax at the end of market value. And that happens. 
Mum dies. Sorry? God's name. God's name. Yeah, that's what I Mum dies, Dad inherits automatically that red ring, so I've got to rethink the role I that I was talking about. But then he goes and gives it to his daughter, Carol Grandstats. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know, I know. How do they find out? How do they find out? <laughs> well, not so much that, but I think that as time goes on, because they don't matching more and more catching people that rent their property out, people mm-hmm. they first, and that, they've got all that now. And as time will go on, it will become more lucrative for them to, to review estates. Yeah, that's where they'll be going looking. Like, exactly, the cartoon tells you. So, can Thank I... Thank you, I <laughs> love that cartoon. Um, so can I get you to click for me now? I know you don't like the next slide, but... Well, I don't think, it, so. I don't understand. The audience might know what it means, but you can talk about it. I want to encourage you to use Excel to keep these records. So, at the top of an Excel spreadsheet, I had a pointer. You'd see. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Use the pointer. Use the pointer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, in an Excel spreadsheet, this is what you normally see a Word document. You can see the button in insert. It'll bring up this menu down the bottom, and right over here is the word link. You click on that it will bring you up all the documents that are in the file that you've got that spreadsheet and you just click on whatever that document is, say it be the cell on the statement on the house, and it will fall into that cell where you were when you did the clicking. And then you can just put beside it the amount. And then the next thing will be, because you get to increase your cost space by your rates, all that sort of stuff, you just click, but they have the document already, it's all scanned, you the box scan and just click, put it in, put the amount in, and then you can total it up. And you've got some records that anyone can understand, the documents aren't going to be perished, but lost in a natural disaster. And best of all, you can dish out copies of them to your children, your executor, so you've got those records and they're copies, proper scan copies for the original. Um, now, in your handouts there, I have actually designed some spreadsheets that are doing this, it's not rocket science, but what I've done is put an instruction sheet attached to them for the 14 different classes of assets you're likely to have and instructing you on what to include. I'm not trying to sell that, I'm just trying to get you the key record, so you can probably do it yourself. But if you want all the, the detail, it's in that spreadsheet. In the Thanks, Julia. Thank no. no, I don't need that. Point up. Okay, now. Okay. Now, who understands the franking credit system? Good on you. Does anyone don't understand franking? That's terrible. The amount of money you've lost in your life would be in the millions. Well, you should have more. <laughs> okay. The way the franking system works, that's a copy of a bank deposit. I don't have shares in that company anymore, thank God. I think they've gone bust. Anyway, there was a sum in the bank there and a franking credit attached. The franking credit is like a McDonald's voucher. You can spend it at the tax office or get it back if you can't spend it. How about that? So you're not just getting a dividend, you're getting a bonus. So to keep it very simple, let's say that we all form a company. Are you with me? We're all members of the company. We make a million bucks profit. That's nice. We pay 30% company tax, see that? Leaving $700,000 over. That, we'll see that. Now the $300,000 tax creates the franking credit. So I'll pay you each a dividend of $700. Every one of you, 700 bucks. And you get a franking credit of $300 with it. Now because that's as good as cash in the bank, you pay tax on it. So I've only given you 700, but you're paying tax on 1,000. Isn't that terrible? Well, wait a minute. The franking credit is worth 300, 300 bucks. The tax is 325. Cuts the tax back to $25. How about that? How about that? The dividend is virtually tax free. All your shares, but if you're older, yeah, that's all right. Now, 
If that's in your self-managed super fund, in pension mode, you get the whole fracking credit back. So if you've got CBA shares paying, paying 5%, you get 3% on top of that. That's the best yield enhancer you could possibly have. Also, the best way that young employed people can save tax. I keep getting emails, how do I save tax? Well, apart from tax deductible superannuation contributions, which they're targeting, that's about the only way you can save tax. So let's just go to, let's pretend we've got 200,000 in shares. And historically, they've done about nine, but I've given it eight, eight here. So let's say that that 200,000 of shares gives us 3.5% income at uh, 7,000, growth of 8,000. So I've made 15,000 this year. How much tax on the growth? Good class, right? Capital gains tax, yes. How, how much tax on the fracking credit? Bugger all, isn't it? It's all been paid for you. So but basically you've made your 15,000 virtually tax free. Isn't that good? Isn't fracking wonderful? Yes, come on, yes. Got on, got on. Okay, now moving on. Cash, shares and property. Now I know we all like different things, but cash is 2.85, I think it's going up to four. All right? It, it will. It's not coming down. It'll keep going up until it stops. And they won't stop until there's blood in the streets, I can tell you. So, I don't know. Now, this is Copenhagen, 2019. Rates were negative. So this couple, if rates are negative, you put your $100,000 on term deposit, you get a capital guaranteed loss of 1%. How good's that? <laughs> but your grandkids, their mortgage payments are paid to them. They have a negative housing rate. How good's that, isn't it? Isn't it? Well, it can't last, can it? That's how bad the central governments put the world in. That's why all these pension funds are holding bonds with negative rates. Now, the trouble is that a bonds are traded. If you have a bond with a negative rate and rates rise, your bond will plunge in value. Some of the bonds held by British pension funds fell 40% a month ago. Now, negative rates are going, thank God, but, you know, the future should never have been there. Now, a lot of people think only property, but property to me has a major problem as a retiree. One is maintenance. One is the land tax and cost. Remember the state government tried to whack our land tax to buggery recently? And the Queensland state government have not indexed land tax rates for years. So as your property doubles because of time, your land tax isn't indexed. So you've got all the ongoings. But secondly, if I've got a million dollars of shares and you've got a million dollar property and we both want a hundred grand, I can cash in a hundred grand and you can't because you can't sell the back steps. So one of the great benefits of shares is liquidity. And I think it's invaluable, all right? That makes sense for you. Yeah. Now, now, that's the worst headline I've seen in my life. Now, what makes it so, you can't read that, can you? Can you read it over there? What makes it so awful? Well, if you read it, it says how homeowners are earning thousands of dollars a week. Now, why are they earning $1,000 a week? Tax-free. See, capital gains tax is never happening. It has happened. Your house may have increased by 52000 which is 1000 bucks a week. That doesn't say it's going to do it next year, is it? So they're just quoting, I mean, capital gains tax is gone. And then we had, you know, the next time it's falling by 1000 a week. And, and, and that's a nonsense as well. Yours may have fallen, mine may have gone up. Paper headlines on property are sheer rubbish. There we had the worst on record. Now, this is four years ago. What's happened since? The biggest boom in history, for God's sake, right? 
And you're, oh God, sell now. Gee, it's terrible, isn't it? There we had, now that's got worse, your house is made 200,000 this time. But yeah, it's just crazy stuff. Now, is that a good, now I bought, had owned a property there. It was a unit, three bedroom, northeast corner. Is that a good investment? Well, what's the obvious question? Where is it? Hedges Avenue, Mermaid Beach. Best street in Queensland, right? I paid $500,000 for it in 1990. Uh, there's the beach out the front. Well, I sold it for $867,000 about four years ago. That money in shares, the index, would now be worth $9.1 million. That's, and I use the index because everyone can do it. You can go to my website, go to Stock Market Calculator, enter any sum you like back 1980, a notional starting date, a notional finishing date, and the man, it'll tell you what it would have been. But my wife says, oh yeah, but it was nice the kids played on the beach, and it was all very nice down there, and very expensive playing on the beach. Now, let's go back. Might not work. There we are. Now see these properties here in Albatross Avenue. They built around 1964-65. I owned a sixth of a six-pack. And I sold my sixth of a six-pack for 160 grand to buy this heap of rubbish. Guess what? The buildings just sold for six million for, for six million bucks. Forty purchase waterfront land. If you're in a property, the money is in the land, right? Not the building. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, this one, come on, come on, so I'm missing the computer. This house I still own. Morningside, Brisbane, it's, it's a unit. I've got an, an old aunt who 15 years ago, she wasn't doing too good in a housing commission place. You know, she was too good to be in there. <coughs> So I bought this apartment and said she could stay there for life at a reduced rent. Well, she just won't die. I mean, she's 93 <laughs> and still going strong. Now, I know, I know, that's the trouble. <laughs> Absolutely. I ring every day, how are you going? I'm good. <laughs> now, now, that, that's now worth about 500 maybe after 13 years. That sum in the index would be worth 1.2 million bucks. But see, the moment she dies, it's gone, sold. We'll be up for 100 grand in capital gains tax. If I were to put that uh, $216,000 into the index, I'd now have 1.2 million paying me 45,000 francs in income, not what she's not paying me, right? And I, I wouldn't have to sell it. So there'll be 100 grand in capital gains tax when I sell that. It's a shocker. So there you are. Now, let's talk about shares. Now, if the papers bugger up property, they also bugger up shares, believe me. In 1979, shares were finished. Sell all your shares, right? All gone. Shares are dead. 1997, the crash of 97. Papers love the headlines. Panic, fall, slump, everything. You know. Then we had 2009, again, shares were finished again, and they picked the bottom of the market. How about that? And what you need to, I keep getting emails. I think I'll get out and get back when the market's turned. It's not possible. It'll turn so quick you'll miss it. When it does turn, oh, it might be a false start, you know. You hang in there. Uh, then we had our day of reckoning. It was, that was four years ago, a day of reckoning. Then we had a, a market meltdown. <laughs> you know, meltdown, reckoning, panic. Everyone will get the virus. Panic again, you know, panic, slump, you name it. I like an index fund. Index funds to me are so simple. You've got every horse in the race. If you've got an index fund, you've got Rio and Telstra and JB Hi-Fi and Woolworths and Coles and everybody else, right? It cannot go broke, unless all those companies go broke, which ain't gonna happen. It's averaged 9% over the last 120 years. 
and it's currently paying about 5% franked. And the older I get, the more I regard my index funds as my crown jewels, you know, instead of playing with some of the things I played with and lost money on. Things like Zillow, you know, Flutter, Grub, you know, Magellan. <laughs> Who's got Magellan? Yeah. Yeah, well, I bought 50, or I don't know if to be happy or not, I bought 50 grand's worth at a dollar. Uh, and they got to 70, so I sold $2 million worth. I've kept 90,000, and now they're down to, what, 10 bucks or something. But I, I don't know. Anyway, I've got faith in Magellan. Now, but, but that's the index. You can just see it plugs along. That's Vanguard. There's two. That's VAS. The other one is STW, the, the, the two I use. Because you've got no decisions to make. You know, you say, oh, well, I could have bought it last year. Well, that's the, they've had something out of sudden bang, haven't they? Uh, with the index, you're not picking winners. You're just getting a steady, secure investment. That's all. It's Sorry? AFIC similar. AFIC and um, AFC, isn't it? AFC, AFIC, Milton, yeah, all those stuff. Yeah, they're, they're good. They're good, yeah, yeah, good, good. Now, here's the next one. What about Bitcoin? When I was attacking Bitcoin when it was up to 60 grand, they called me a lemming, a stupid old man, I'm out of date, you know. Can't go wrong. Well, you know, to me, Bitcoin's a punt. I mean, if you want to go to the race on the weekend, you can pick the horse, the race, and the jockey, can't you? And it's form. And based on that, you can make a decision, can't you? Want to buy property? Well, I like the street, I like the house, know what I mean? Or shares, I like this, this, this. Bitcoin, it's a sheer punt. I'm punting, it'll, it'll, someone, someone will pay more than me. You know? If you want to do it, it's a gamble. That's all. Agree? Now, then we have, have you heard of NFTs? That's the big rage. My son rang me from LA, NFTs, Dad. Mate, mate bought one for 10 grand, it was sold for 60 grand the next week, you know. They're non-fungible means non-copyable. If you've got a non-fungible token, it's a unique thing, you know. Uh, so you could actually, if you do NFT horse racing on Google, you can actually go and buy, you know, you can buy shares in a horse, in a computer horse, or a computer jockey, or a racetrack, all sorts of things. If that's what you want to do, it's gambling. Then we have this. Now, the next big takeaway tonight is anything advertised is high risk, all right? You don't, good companies don't advertise, mainly. Wary, if you see any sportsman or politician in it, run a mile. Now, I know Matty Hayden, he's a lovely bloke, but he was paid to do that. Now, Nant Whiskey was offering 9.5% capital guaranteed over four years. The idea was you bought a barrel of whiskey from Nant and they kept it, and four years later they bought it at guaranteed 9.5%. One of my son's mates worked there. He said, he said, no, he said, they're selling the same barrel over and over. Oh. So I took it to ASIC. I said, well, we don't know if whiskey is a security or not. Oh. I said, I can, I can be a secret chopper. You can't be a secret chopper. You can't do anything about it. So they wouldn't listen to me. And I'm on their local board, for God's sake. Two years away, it all goes belly up, you know. So that's another warning, isn't it? Stay away from those things. I keep hearing about retirees lost all their money in these silly scams, you know. Okay, now superannuation. If I said you've got a target on your back, this is the big target. They're setting us up. Are our retirees too rich? Have you got too much money? Because you see, they've discovered some people are dying and they haven't spent all their super. Therefore, they had too much in the first place. Don't count the fact they might be thinking about aged care. They're uncertain, you know. So, we have, this was recently, 80,000 people have, have more than 2 million in super. Just terrible, isn't it? Oh, frightful. 
Then we had, this is this week, call to cut super tax breaks. Jim Chalmers has now announced, here we look at the system very, very carefully. Who knows what they will do? It's a dead set if you've got more than $5 million in the go at you, but that's, I had lunch yesterday with a senior tax official, he's saying, well, it's very hard to do that. It's just impossible to do it. He said, for one reason, super funds don't even balance their books for six months afterwards. How are you going to do it? And then we have cut super tax breaks for the rich. And they've discovered one fund has $400 million in it. There's about 12 funds with big balances. And, the, uh, and I know people in the tax office tell me, like some of those have got, like, uh, <clears throat> the guy has a business, he's got a factory, the factory grows, his fund owns shares in the business, da 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 da. But it's a legacy issue. You see, the most you can leave to your spouse or kids is $1.7 million. That's the most you can leave in super. The rest must be cashed out. So if you've got $5 million bucks in super, there'll be $1.7 to the partner's account, if the partner's there, into their account, and 3.3 .3 in the bank account. See what I mean? So in t and all these people are old. In 15 years, they're all gone anyway. There's no money in that. But it's interesting because labour, the biggest contributor to labour's fortunes is the industry super funds. And they're very keen to hang on to the money. I think what they'll do, but most people don't agree with me, <clears throat> I reckon they'll make people draw down their super in accumulation at the same rate as their pension funds. I don't know. I don't know. Who knows? Because really the super the system's fine now. Contributions have been capped. You know, you can put in $110,000 of after-tax dollars. If you're wealthy, you've got to earn 220 to have that. And if you earn more than 200000 so that they take a third off the contributions, you know. It's no longer possible to have, have big balances. Now, changes from last year you can now contribute to 67 with no work test, and that's important. You can, the concessional contribution are now 27, they're the tax deductible, and now 27 and a half. Non-concessional, 110. Okay, but no contributions up when you're at 1.7. Now, now, the new changes are very important. The work test is abolished to 75 but only for after-tax contributions. This will be very important, as you'll see in a minute, all right? The age of eligibility has gone from 65 to 60 for downsizing contributions, and now reduced to 55, which is meaningless anyway, because if you contribute to 75, you wouldn't need a downsizer. Now, do you all understand the re-contribution strategy? <coughs> Probably not. Do you understand the death tax? No. Death tax? No. No. On super. Okay. Your super balance is taxable and non-taxable components. The taxable is all deductible contributions and their earnings. So everyone's got taxable. The non-taxable is money you put in there from after-tax dollars. So the average fund is mainly taxable. You can leave that to your partner tax-free. But if it goes to a non-dependent, it's a 17% death tax. How about that? So if you've got half a million in super, there can be $35,000 in death tax to a non-dependent. It doesn't matter if it goes to your partner, but it does matter if the partner becomes on their own, doesn't it? Yes? Now, now there's, a way, there's always a way around it. What's the best way to do it? You give your power of attorney instructions that when your death is imminent, and the Queen died quick, but she didn't die like that. Most people, there's some notice. He takes all the money out and puts that in your bank account. Death tax solved. So very, very important that your attorney has instructions to take all your superannuation out tax-free if your death is near. Okay? 
except if you've got a partner, then you better take advice about that, all right? Make sense? The other way is, okay, the guy's 65, 66, 69, 70, 71, he takes out $330,000 out of his account, and that's legal. He recontributes 330, and that becomes after-tax dollars. He recontributes the 330,000, and that all becomes non-taxable. So by starting, say, at 65 and going through it, you can nearly convert all your superannuation from taxable to non-taxable purely by the recontribution strategy. Okay. But always be aware, once you get to 1.7, you can't do it, because you, you can't put any more in. Okay? Make sense? Questions? Now... So you can, sorry, so you can do... Um, so you can do that with the super after you've already rolled it out into a... Yeah, you can do it at any time, but you can do it to 75 now. And that's why I said the downsizing contribution, the reduced to 55, was a nonsense. Uh, because you don't need the downsize if you're 55, you can use the up to 75. So I was having a haircut yesterday. And my barber said, oh, I've just sold my house, use a downsizer. When did you sell it? N nine months ago. I said, well, nine months, you got six, uh, 60 days, I think. Was it 60 days? Or, oh, I think it's 60 or 90 days. Oh. I said, wait a minute. You're 74, your wife's 70 you're going to use the ordinary contribution rules. So you can, you see. You didn't need the downsizer. But if you got both, you would do the ordinary contribution first because the downsize has no limit. You can have $10 million in super and still do the downsizing contribution. So you wouldn't go the, the non-concessional personal contribution first if it took you over the limit. So you'd do, the, you'd do it... So you, you'd, you wouldn't do the downsizer first. You'd do the other one first. All right? Is that every three years? Every three years. Yeah, every three years. Well, it's 110 grand a year, and you can bring forward three years. Yeah, yeah. And catch-up contributions. Now, these are very, very important. Uh, basically, you can catch up deductible contributions which you haven't made. So this couple, that's the death tax right now. This couple was 66. He's got 600,000 in super and she's got 300,000 in super. Now you can't use catch-up contributions if your balance exceeds half a million. Very simply solved. He takes out 150 grand and gives that to her and she contributes it. You with me? So now they've both got 450,000 in super instead of a, a six and a three. That makes sense? both under half a million. Now, he retired years ago, six years ago. So he's got all those unused caps he can use. They can both use, because they retired at 60. Now, why would you want to do this? Why would you want to do it? Because they've just sold a property with a $400,000 capital gain. And when you halve it, it's $100,000 each, isn't it? That wipes it out. So that knowledge of catch-up contributions can wipe out a big capital gains tax bill. Interesting, isn't it? Mm. Questions about that? It seems to confuse people. All you're doing is making deductible contributions which you hadn't made. That's all. Okay. Uh, to what? To accumulation, superannuation, no defined benefit. No. Accumulation, yeah, you, you can't go into a defined benefit fund. You don't know. Okay. Now, <laughs> well, you, you, you can go to 75. Oh, you, uh, you've got to be 60. You can't. Oh, well, okay, if you're over 67, you've got to pass the work test. But passing the work test is not anyway. All you've got to do is get a job for 30 days. That's easy. If you can't get a job for 30 days at a year in this climate, there's something wrong, all right? Make sense? Okay, now, say, say, that's our capital gains tax now. Understand the age pension rules. Now, in your handout, you've got the pension charts, which are there, all right? And you've got them. 
you've got to be of pensionable age, which is there. Are you with me? And there's an asset test and an income test. But they're out of kill, and you are not tested on both. They assess you at the one that gives you the least pension. And once a couple get to around four fifty thousand dollars of assets, you tend to become asset tested, which means the income test doesn't work, doesn't needed. So if you're a couple here, and you've got eight hundred thousand of assets, you're about one fifty pension. For one fifty pension, you can be earning like sixty two thousand a year. So the income test does not apply to asset-tested pensioners. Now I'm going to invite Mel, who's a financial planner, to come up and talk about the real world with pensions. Tell us some of the, there's, there's a lot of mistakes, isn't there? Yeah, there is. You can, you can come a bit closer if you okay, want. I just don't want the microphone. I don't think, that's me. <laughs> okay. You're all right? Okay. Okay. Yes. So what are, what are some of the things you've been seeing with people? Uh, a lot of people overvalue their assets, I find. So when they apply for the aged pension, they usually put it under the, or the contents. Replacement. Yeah. Yeah. And put under the insured amount instead of what they would sell it for fire sale on the street. Mm. Yeah. So, so if you put your assets down at 60,000, and, and you should, should be five, that could cost you another pension. So your assets, furniture, cars, garage sale value, no one should have more than $5,000 on their furniture and stuff. Okay? What's another one, Mel? Uh, another one that I find is they wait too long to apply. So they reach retirement and then they don't put their application for age pension. They wait too, like, sometimes it can take months. And, they, and then there's a query about it. Yes. And they've got to do something. Yeah. And the months tick by, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Yeah? And then yeah. once they get the application through, sometimes they can ask for more paperwork as well. Always. It can always. take longer. Never satisfied. Yes. You can always ring them up. Yeah, so that's some things I find. Um, the other one is, is that they don't apply because their partner still works. Yep. And then so they don't apply for the aged pension, so they don't think they're eligible. Yeah, well, see, in that case there, the, if, if that's a couple, I mean, the partner could be earning, you know, 49, 50,000 a year. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Another one? Uh, the other one would be when they're in superannuation and then they move it to pension phase soon, too soon and then they miss out on settling benefits. I think a lot of people don't know that money in super does not count to you reach pensionable age. Now it's becoming common now an older bloke and a younger wife. Now, if you're not frightened of the younger wife shooting through <laughs> by putting all your money in the younger wife's name you get a nice big fat age pension. But the moment that's converted to pension mode, it counts. That's one of the biggest mistakes in the business, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah sure is. Got any more for us? Um, no, not really. How about the case where a couple, you and I, yep. we, we always leave our assets to each other, don't we? Yes. Yeah, always. Yes. So our will says in, in each other. Joint names. Yeah. Joint names. And we've got assets of $800,000 for Centrelink. You see that? Well, I drop dead. I'm gone. The cutoff point for a single person is about $600,000. So you've just lost your pension. Yes. Because you've dropped under over the, you've now gone from eligible to over, over the limit. Yeah, as a single. As a single. That's right. Yeah. So the way around that is you make sure when you're drafting your will, you take into account what would happen when one partner dies. Better to leave it to your kids then, because the kids can't, you can't refuse to re bequest. If I leave you, I don't think you can't refuse it. That's right. Thanks, Mel, you've been great. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, there's been a huge campaign by national seniors to let pensioners work. It's a bit of a furphy because it only affects income-tested pensioners. 
And for some strange reason, at the moment now, you can have the amount that's on the bottom of the chart. So a single person can earn 180 bucks a week from anywhere before they start to lose 50 cents in the dollar. You can also earn 150 bucks a week from work. They've just increased that by 80 bucks. So now you can earn as a single 160 bucks from anywhere and 150 from work, another 80 from work. Now, the strub reason is beyond me, seriously, they're going to, that only goes till next June. Now, why would they do that? It's crazy stuff. So that's called the work bonus. But it's a, it's a campaign that's been pretty successful. Now, there's a great concession calculator. What national seniors have a brilliant concession calculator. And there's many concessions we don't know about. Just log on to national seniors and you um, calculate it. Now, there's all the cards, you've got the different cards, but I did it for me. First of all, have you all got that? If you're over 65, anyone over 65 haven't got it? No test. No test. Cheap on buses and ferries and a third off your car red Joe. And I discovered I get an energy supplement. So that gives me, I also get um, about, so I also get the energy. I get 470 bucks as well as an energy and gas supplement. So if you've got that card, which we all can get, there's no test except age. If you've got that card, you'll get eight bucks a week off your gas and electricity. It's automatic. That was worth coming, wasn't it? I love getting that. Yeah, there we go. Now, the Commonwealth Seniors Health Card, uh, that's the one that retirees love as well. It is not assets tested. And they've just, it's only income tested, and they've raised the bar so high, I think everyone's going to qualify for this. Because the income test is the deemed amount of your super from which you are drawing a pension. But since Malcolm Turnbull attacked the system in 2016, the most we can have in pension mode is 1.7 million. So let's say you're a couple and you've got 1.7 million in super, that's deemed to be earning $74,000. The cutoff point for a couple has just been raised to $144,000. So you can be a couple in a $10 million house and a huge beach house that costs nothing, a non-rented rented beach house, and a great big boat, uh, five million each in super, as long as you earn less than 69,000, you get the Commonwealth Seniors Health Card. Now, only one trick you've got to apply, they don't give it, you have to apply to Centrelink, that's all right. And if you're having, uh, I, mean, I go, often get asked, you might have an unusual income because of a capital gain, they, you can tell them, and that's, if that's a one-off, it's fine. What age is that one for? You've got to be pensionable age. You've got to be pensionable age, but not, but not getting a pension, because you wouldn't need it if you're getting a pension. Any questions about it? Here we go. Now, now. <coughs> equity release. The government has made it very, very... Well, first of all, the government's worried that we don't spend enough and die with more money than we should have. The government thinks we should use our house to live off when we retire. Okay? Now, there's only two ways to do that. You downsize or borrow, right? Okay? Which I'll talk about in, in a minute. The two things, there's a pension loan scheme, which you can get at 3.95%, and reverse mortgage of various sorts. I'm going to call on Nicole, is she there somewhere? And she's going to take us through, she's a mortgage broker, and I'm going to have a, have a little break while she tells about all about the home equity, all right? There you go. Sorry, that's not your, there you are. Okay, there you are, Nicole. Welcome, Nicole, people. You'll, you'll need the pointer. Thanks, mate. 
How you going? So as Noel said, I'm Nicole. I'm a mortgage broker here locally in Mackay. Um, and I'm just going to give you a little bit of information about reverse mortgages and, and what they are. Just to, um, to just give you that little bit of knowledge and, and understanding of how it could possibly help you if, if that's something you wanted to look into. So, um, let's just, okay. um, so basically a reverse mortgage is, is just a home loan um, for people aged over 60 to give you access to equity in your home. Um, it's a um, home loan that basically, given it's for you over the age of 60, we understand you won't be earning income. Um, you don't actually have any regular payments that would be required to be met on that particular facility. So um, that also allows you to um, take out a lump sum amount if you were looking to maybe do something to your home or go on the, the overseas holiday that you were wanting. Um, it will also allow you to have a regular income stream paid to you if you're wanting to top up maybe a pension that you're receiving so that you can um, have a little bit more money to spend. Um, and it also will allow you to um, have a line of credit so that you can have a pre-approved amount available to you in the case that you may want to do things in the future. So there are three ways you can use it and you actually can set it up so that you can use it as a combination of those three. So you don't just have to have one set way, you can actually request to have it set up in, in three different ways. Um, interest does get charged like any other loan, so um, they are lending you money so they do charge you interest and there is a, um, it is a slightly higher rate I think than what at the moment with rates increasing, the rates have gone up. So we are looking at interest rates around the seven to eight percent. So it is it is higher than a standard home loan. Um, and if you sell your home or if you do pass away, you are, do actually have to pay that debt out in full. So it, it does have to be repaid at that particular time. Um, also, if you live in your home for a while but then decide to move into aged care, that's another um, what you would have to pay out at that time, or there are some options you might be able to speak with a lender about being able to keep it at that time. Um, like any other home loan, you do get charged interest, as I mentioned before, but what happens in this particular instance is it compounds. And so, as I said, you don't have to make payments. It means that if you start out with a loan balance of 200,000 and you're getting charged interest on that, it is just gonna be continually growing the balance. But that also means that you are paying interest on your interest as well. So you do um, that you do need to be aware of that. Um, any fees and charges as well can also get charged onto that loan for you. So again, you're not out of pocket any money. It does basically just all continue to move through. I think I was meant to go past the next page, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the other option is you can also repay that reverse mortgage in full at any time or partially. So if you were to sell other assets at any time, um, you can actually pay some debt off. You don't have to keep the whole loan component out there for you. Um, ways you can use a reverse mortgage. So you can use it to refinance if you've got a current home loan. Um, you can actually refinance the existing amount of debt that you currently have. You can use it for home improve, improvements, travel, um, a new car, consolidating any other debts that you might have if you are not wanting to continue to pay that. Um, medical costs, aged care, so there is an option available for you if you are going into an aged care facility. Um, and also it can be, like I mentioned before, just some extra income to help top up your pension to give you a little bit more income to spend. Um, some things that you need to understand about applying for um, a reverse mortgage, the process does take time. There's a lot of regulatory requirements and identification requirements um, that are in place. And so just be prepared that if it is something you are looking at doing, you do want to allow for um, two to three months as a worst case scenario to make sure that that is all, all met. Um, it is mandatory to get legal advice, so it's something that you do have to actually meet with a solicitor throughout the process, and that's a requirement of um, the lenders as well. So they will walk through that with you. Um, there is some um, caps on how much you can borrow depending on your age, and so there's a table I'll show you shortly which 
which does sort of detail um, the fact that depending on your age, the percentage of how much you can actually borrow against your property value. Um, there is also a um, negative equity protection in place. And so that's something that came about in 2012, which means that if you were to go into a reverse mortgage, you're never gonna be in a situation where your property is um, worth less than the amount that you actually owe on it. So you're not gonna be leaving any debt behind for your loved ones. It will actually be paid out because they'll cap it. Um, you can also request to cap it at a certain amount if you're wanting to as well um, through the process with lenders. So some people feel a bit more comfortable with that. You can then, if you're wanting to leave um, some, make sure there's some equity for your children when they sell the property, you can actually cap it um, along through the process. Um, you also need to just make sure that your property type is suitable. So the postcode in Mackay, um, so one of the things to check is postcodes, but Mackay postcode is, is fine, 4740. However, um, you would want to check with the lender specifically if you have, um, have a postcode outside of 4740, just to make sure that it is suitable. Um, and the property type, so um, you know, some rural properties might not be suitable depending on the size, so it's just checking that with the lender. Um, and also, you do want to just make sure that you're checking, is what you're going to do going to impact your government benefits? So if you're taking out a lump sum amount of money, just making sure that it's not going to have any impact, impacts there. But if you um, have a chat to a financial advisor, they can help you work through that. So this is the small table that we have available um, in relation to how much you can borrow, so the percentage of your property value based on your age. And just bearing in mind, this is based on, um, you can actually have one person um, that's retired and then another a person is age 55 um, on application there. So not both parties have to have retired, um, but the minimum age for the, the second person has to be 55. So um, as you can see, 55 has the star there, so the most you can borrow at that time is 15%, and um, it goes up until age 90, and the maximum you can borrow is 50% of the property value. Um, lenders, what you will find is that the lenders that offer reverse mortgages are not the, the big four banks and, and banks that you may have heard of before. So it is going to be new lenders that you, you may not um, have heard anything about, but just important to make sure that you do your due diligence in, in looking into the lenders. Um, and things that you, you want to make sure of is that you understand what fees they're going to be charging, just like you would when you're getting a normal home loan. So fees, charges, and interest rates available, and just comparing those um, with the options out there. Um, making sure that there's flexibility there for you so that you can do what you are wanting to do. And that goes back to talking about the products as well and, and the ways that you can have that set up. Um, again, like I said before, your property, making sure it's acceptable with that particular lenders that you're looking at. Um, and then looking into the different loan types that they have available, just like you would if you were taking out a, um, a home loan in the past. You want to make sure you're doing the same things with, with these lenders. Um, and we would always recommend that the steps to take when you are looking into this is obviously educate yourself as much as you possibly can on what it looks like. Um, talking to a um, financial advisor is a great first step in looking into your current situation, so we would always recommend that. Um, the moneysmart.gov um, website is a great resource that has some information in there um, and they do actually have some calculators that you can utilise on their website to give you a bit of an idea of what it looks like for your particular situation. So if you are feeling comfortable to jump on the internet and do that, definitely do that or grab someone, a family member that might be able to help you through that process to, to have a look at that. Um, and just compare the lenders. Make sure that you've, you've looked at all of the options um, so that you've, you're comfortable to do that. And that's really it for me. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Only the pointer. You can't. Um, so what happens is if you have any current debt on your property, they'll actually take that over as an amount and they will have, hold the first mortgage on your property. So um, it wouldn't be a second mortgage. 
I, on that field, I think you're better to leave it as long as you can because that reduces the compounding. <laughs> I think it's important to involve your family because if they can pay the interest, the debt won't increase. Because you're spending the kids' money, basically. So if they can pay the interest, the debt won't increase. Make sense? Now, then there's downsizing. Now, the, what you need to understand, to downsize is probably going to cost about 150 grand in changeover costs. So you may decide, well, I'd rather stay where I am and maybe take out a 50 grand reverse mortgage. It'll be much cheaper than downsizing. But then you may be in a house that needs repairs, you know, uh, and you're better off to downsize. So it's, it's, it's horses for courses. If you're in a house that needs repairs and you keep thinking you'll move, you'll reach a stage where you can't afford the repairs as they're building up. You know, so it's a big decision. Also, the big decision about the downsizing move is that if you're on the age pension, your home is exempt. So if you're in a $1.2 million house on the full pension and you downsize to a $600,000 house, you'd release five or six hundred thousand dollars of accessible assets and that could make a big hole in your age pension. So it's very important you understand the potential effect on your age pension about downsizing. And having, as I said before, you can put $300,000 each into super with no age limit and no superannuation cap. So it's there if you need it, right? Now, very important. We're living in the age of electric vehicles, aren't we? Aren't we? Well, there's a lot of potential fights with big apartments when some people want to charge their Tesla and, and other people don't want to have them paying for it. So I think you need to make very certain if you're going to an apartment, what will be the thing if you buy an EV eventually? Because eventually you will, all right? I've got an electric, I've got a Tesla. My wife has a Lexus hybrid electric. Now my Tesla has a range of 500 Ks which is scary, it's so little. Her Lexus PHEV has an 80k electric range and a 900k hybrid range. So I could drive that to Brisbane from here. And I think they're the way of the future. Like she just brings a car in, plugs it into the, into the garage, any old power point. Next morning, 80k of electric sitting there. She bought the car in May, she's had two tankfuls of petrol in, since May. So I think the electric hybrid is the way to go, not a straight electric car. Also, people don't understand with electric vehicles that every car charges at a different speed. I sold a big Tesla by a little Tesla. Little Tesla charged at half the rate of the big one did, even though it's three years younger. And charges differ enormously. Now, Kia have a new electric Kia which can charge in 16 minutes, but there's no charger in Australia capable of doing it. I know, so interesting stuff, anyway. So, now the future. They, um, what, the government, what the government thinks is that your life should revolve around three things. The first thing is a lifestyle income. That's your account-based pension. You, you all know about the account-based pension, right? You just draw it from your super. Everyone has a drawback and a good point. The drawback is your balance can go up and down as we've seen, doesn't it? Doesn't it? But if you need 50 grand, you got it there, all right? So it gives you access to a lump sum. The downsize is the balance fluctuates. You can go to the it, to the income for the the pension is the safety net, so the pension is is, is your safety net, your account based pension is you cash and everything, and they're now developing what's called lifetime income pensions, whereby you commit part of your super, and that pays you an income for life. Okay, 
And if you die prematurely, you get most of it back. Now, the big benefit of these is that only 60% counts for the assets test. So I'll show you. Here's a couple. with just say $900,000 plus other things, they're just over the assets test threshold, right? They can't get a pension. If they put $300,000 in a lifetime pension, that would give them 20,000 year income for life plus 8,000 year pension. So they would now have 28 grand a year indexed plus $600,000 still in the account-based pension. There's all new products coming out. There's a new Q-Super product. AMP have just launched a new one. Uh, there's all sorts of things happening in this space. So there you are. That's a summary of where we are. Uh, <coughs> I hope you all get one of my retirement books. It's, it's, it's all in there anyway. Don't be frightened. In need, email me, all right? So thanks for, for being such a great one. Thank you. <laughs>